Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so, my first role is just to welcome everyone here today. Uh, this is a celebration of Prof. Kruger's career. Um, but she has told me, I must say, the first part, part of her career. Apparently, she's planning a second part of her career. <laughs> so, we all know. <laughs> So, I mean, uh, um, so the day was created uh, as a celebration of a career, and the speakers that have been invited is people uh, that she worked with in the past, and many of them still she's ongoing working with her, um, and some of her PhD candidates. Um, but more than just um, people she worked with, a lot of them are their, her friends and colleagues that they built a relationship over a long time period. So I'd like to welcome all of them. I'd like to welcome everyone here for the today. Um, today is going to be all about her. Uh, and tonight we have a function uh, as a farewell. But firstly, as I said, farewell part one. So she will be back. <laughs> so my first duty is to introduce the first speaker. This is also an online meeting. Um, so there is people online. So our first speaker this morning is Prof. Douglas Vassenaar, and his talk is Some Ethics Debates in Health-Related Social Science Research. Um, so he's a, a clinical psychologist. He's the chair of the UKZN Biomedical Research Committee. He's the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Empirical Research of Human Research Ethics. He's a member of the Ministerial Advisory Committee on COVID-19. Um, in 2002, he started working together with Prof. Kruger, and together they are the co-directors of the Seretti PhD program. And Seretti is a South African research ethics training initiative, a U.S. National Institute of Health Faculty funded program, and currently offering PhD training in research at KwaZulu-Natal and currently in its first cycle. So we know that a large part of Prof's work have been in ethics, um, so I'd like to welcome Prof Vassenaar for his talk. Thank you. Good morning, colleagues. Goedemora. Thank you, Chair, for welcoming me. Uh, thank you very much indeed for inviting me to uh, be present at this uh, occasion of Professor Gruger's retirement. Um, it's a great honor for me. I'm very flattered to be here. Um, and I just have a little warning to Mariana that uh, if you think that a career is hectic, retirement is more hectic. Um, and you're the kind of person who's going to make it hectic. So that's a little health warning. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to talk about a subject that I've uh, dabbled in for the last couple of years um, as, a, as an academic and as a chair of a, uh, an ethics committee. Uh, we've had to put up a, a lot with um, particular issues in uh, social science related health research and also just social science research. And I speak as a social scientist working in the health uh, domain. So over the years, we've had to put together some sort of a response to the complaints we've had from social scientists uh, about them having to do ethics. They um, seem to hate doing research ethics. They seem to hate having their work scrutinized by third parties. Um, and I think we have to engage with some of those concerns and some of those critiques, which I, I have tried to do here. Um, and I always say, as a chair of a biomedical ethics committee, that, that we've got the medics tamed. Uh, research ethics is totally expected and accepted in most medical schools around the country. They see it as business as usual, but the social science people are still a kind of a wild bunch that um, need to be socialized into research ethics. And I do intend to be a little provocative. Um, so I'd like to share some of these thoughts with you, if I can just find the page down button. 
Um, so I just want to present a framework that I've really found extremely helpful over the years. The irony is the framework actually comes from uh, clinical trials, um, but I use it to sell research ethics really to social scientists working in the research domain. Um, and it's a sort of an intellectual toolbox that I try to teach our students and I try to teach uh, young researchers as well as a way of navigating their way through um, research ethical issues. Um, and I'd welcome your thoughts on whether you find it useful. So just to start with the big picture, that we need to just remind ourselves that the purpose of research is to develop generalizable knowledge um, about our world, about the people in our world, um, so that we can make evidence-based changes and evidence-based improvements to the world that we live in. Um, so generally all around the world, the aims of research are recognized as a good, as a, as a public benefit. But like lots of things, those goods come at a cost, and they come with certain risks. And we cannot, as happened during the Nazi era and during the Tuskegee trials, just treat people as a means to an end, um, as a stepping stone on the road to developing evidence-based solutions. There need to be checks and balances, and there need to be cautions along the way. So research ethics really tries to make sure that people are not just being abused, that people are not just being seen as um, basically objects to be used and abused in the service of the research enterprise. And research ethics doesn't pretend to be perfect. It is really trying to make us find the least harmful way. Um, and research ethics involves a degree of moral discomfort and ethics discomfort. It's a trade-off. Um, there's no squeaky clean, tidy solution to a lot of the tricky issues in research ethics. And what we're trying to look for is the least harmful route. So ethics tries to really protect participants from harm, but at the same time to promote the welfare of participants. And yes, it is a kind of a restraint on science. It does kind of hold scientists back. And I think that in the biomedical field, that is accepted generally. But some of my dear social science colleagues and people working in social science really resent the collar and they resent the pullback. Um, but it is part of what has to happen if we're going to do socially responsible um, research. And what I try and say to them is that ethics also promotes good science. It's not in opposition to good science that um, if participants feel cared for and they feel well treated and they feel respected, you're gonna get better data. And your better data will be because they will engage much more actively with you as a researcher. They will tell you stuff in your research design that you didn't think about, that you don't address grannies like that in our culture. If you want the grannies to participate, this is how you speak to them. Um, and you get little tips and they improve your access to the community that you're hoping to engage with. Your participants are much, likely, much more likely to give you truthful data about socially uh, awkward topics um, that plague our country and that plague our health system. They're likely to give you honest and critical feedback that these people are not going to come to your study because they don't like this person or they don't like this question or they don't like that clinic. Um, they're much more likely return to return for follow-up if it's a multi-stage um, multi research project. And basically all of that is going to improve your data. It's going to strengthen the quality of your data. It's not a fight between ethics and good data. I'm not going to speak about the history of research ethics, but we all just need to be reminded that research ethics exists not because a bunch of nice people got together and thought, you know, it's the right thing to do. Research ethics exists because a lot of really terrible things happened to people and a lot of terrible things were done to people. And research ethics was a reaction to try and tidy that up and to try and prevent it and to try and make sure that those kinds of abuses don't happen again. And I normally have about 20 slides on the different kinds of abuses that led to 
the formation of formal research ethics as we know it today. But I'm going to skip all of that. And I just want to say that of those abuses, several of those big studies were in fact social science studies. They were not just biomedical studies. So the Wichita jury study, uh, Milgram's obedience experiments when he was trying to understand how Nazi um, officials just obeyed orders and did things that were atrocities to humanity. And those were social science um, interventions. The work of Diedrich Stapel in the Netherlands on um, fostering a racist agenda and racist notions of intelligence. Um, those are all social science studies. So it's not just the medics who did bad stuff. Um, a lot of social scientists have done really bad stuff. Um, so they qualify to have research ethics oversight. Their history is not squeaky clean. So that's all I'm going to say about the history. And over the years, I've had to deal with a lot of resistance to ethics review. And obviously, in academic settings, resistance is good. Debate is good. Argument is good. Opposition is good. Um, but we need to interrogate the resistance and try and understand it and try and unpack it. Um, and it's not just in South Africa, it's global. <clears throat> so I have, with good students and colleagues, tried to interrogate the resistance to ethics review, particularly from social scientists working within and outside of the health sector. And even though there's resistance, I think it's really important that we shouldn't forget that participants must be treated ethically. How you operationalize that, that's a separate argument. But the fact that there is resistance doesn't mean that you have license to do with people whatever you want to do. This is a distinction that I found really helpful when interrogating the noise of resistance to ethics review, is to try to separate principled objections from pragmatic objections. The principled objections are ones that we really have to interrogate as scholars, as ethicists, as academics. The pragmatic ones are operational. And if you interrogate the complaints from many social scientists about research ethics, most of their complaints, I would hesitate, I would venture to say, are about the pragmatics. It's so slow. Ethics approval takes so long. There's so much paper and there's so much writing. And, um, that's different from some of the principled concerns. So I'll touch on some of those very quickly and there may be others that you've thought of as well. So the, the first principled one is people saying this is messing with our academic freedom. I should be free as an intellectual, as an academic, to chase an idea. My response to that is you can chase your ideas, but as soon as you engage with human people, they have rights to be treated fairly. They have rights to be treated ethically. Um, the next point, and I think this has some merit, is, and maybe this should be, I think one of my PhD students actually told me to move this point, um, and I think he's right. Uh, one of the objections is that because the ethics review process is so cumbersome that, and you may have done this as supervisors yourself, to say, that's a really great idea, but that's going to take 12 years to get through the ethics committee. Let's just do like a simple idea so you get your PhD. Um, and that is a concern. Um, we have to have ethics committees that are helpful, that can say to you, okay, that is a complex idea, but let's break it down into bite-sized pieces. So the research ethics committee should also be enabling and shouldn't be set up as a huge wall um, or a barrier or a castle that you can't penetrate, that you can't get through. Because we don't, we want innovation in research. We don't want good students to do dumbed down, uh, simplified research proposals. At the same time, we've all seen master's proposals that really are the work of three PhDs. So that also has to be managed a little bit. Um, some people argue that the criteria that are used by research ethics committees are inappropriate to social science research. Again, I, I have bias, but uh, I don't see that. Some people have argued that the ethical codes that we have to apply are not discipline specific, that there should be one for psychology and one for social work and one for anthropology. 
Again, I, I, I don't buy that necessarily. Um, and I think it creates a lot of noise because ethics committee then have to apply 27 different codes when they receive different proposals from different disciplines. Another principled concern is that <clears throat> do, does the fact that there were abuses in the past justify the constraints that research ethics imposes in the present? And I'm not a historian or a philosopher, I'll leave that to colleagues like Professor Van Nico, who's here. Um, can we justify present constraints based on historical atrocities? To me, it, it just seems like the right thing to do. If something went wrong in the past, we need to do what we can, based on today's understandings, to make sure it doesn't happen again. This is, maybe this is also pragmatic, but there's a growing literature saying if you submit the same protocol to three different ethics committees, you get three completely different reviews. And that is a good challenge. I think it's something we should address. I would argue that it's not necessarily a bad thing. All of us have submitted papers to peer-reviewed journals. Reviewer on, sorry, reviewer one, reviewer two, reviewer three. They all have different angles on the same problem. Um, and maybe that is just an enriching process, provided, of course, that the variability is not incompatible. But those of us that are editors, you've also had reviews which say, this is junk, don't publish it, it's not publishable, I don't want to see it again. And other, other reviewers say, look, it has some merit if you fix this and fix that. And another reviewer sends one line and says, wonderful, um, publish, no corrections. That's academia. The next bullet is also something we have to engage with in a multicultural society, is the assumption that the ethical principles we use are applicable to all cultures uh, and all societies. And there's been a lot of work developing a code for the SAN in this country, a lot of work developing codes for research with uh, Aboriginal peoples in Australia and New Zealand, and we have to listen to those codes. Are they? Do they flag things that we have missed? Do they flag things that are absent from the frameworks that we currently use? And I think that's an important principle. The last one sort of makes me chuckle a bit, and some social scientists say, the ethics review system that you're applying to us is biomedical. Um, and I think that argument has absolutely zero merit whatsoever. Um, and the irony is, that the introduction of research ethics into biomedicine was driven by the humanities. And they're saying, this is good for medicine, but it's not good for us. Um, and the codes themselves are not biomedical. They are philosophical, they are ethical. Um, so it's a very superficial argument in my view. The pragmatic stuff I think is a lot easier to deal with. <clears throat> that um, there's mission creep. And those of you that are ethics chairs or have been ethics chairs, you get dumped with other stuff that's got nothing to do with ethics. Because you review our proposals, won't you just check the budget? Won't you just check um, this or that? Um, and the committee gets burdened with a lot of stuff. The, my particular hysteria at the moment is about the Poppy Act. Um, and I don't really want to deal with the Poppy Act as a research ethics chair, but the research office at the university is passing it down the stairs to me, and I'm trying to throw it back up the stairs. Um, there is the issue of delays, practical delays. We hold up research, but I've got some empirical news that one of uh, my colleagues, my ex-students who's working at Stellenbosch in the research office, Ms. Uh, Gumalo, I got her to, inter to interrogate a sample of our database at UKZN to look at the intervals in the research review process. So how long did it take from submission to first review? How long did it take from the first review to the resubmission by the investigator? How long did it take for the committee to then review that resubmission and arrive at a decision? The single biggest delay in the approval process certainly on our data, we didn't publish it unfortunately, but the thesis is publicly available. The single biggest delay is when the protocol is back with the PI 
after the review. It's empirical data. Um, so I go to faculty meetings and somebody stands up and says, I want to complain about the ethics committee. They're delaying our work. And I say, bring your protocol. And 90% of the time, there's like a 12-month delay from the PI getting their feedback and, and resubmitting to us. And they say, it took 14 months to get permission. Well, 12 of those months was on your desk. What's the problem? I'm not saying we haven't got room to improve. There's lots of room to improve. Um, the forms are annoying. The forms can be improved. Um, we need to get rid of trivial questions that are unrelated to ethics. There is a bit of bureaucracy. <clears throat> and to come back to social science, there are qualitative researchers who say, I'm just having conversations with people. This is not, I'm not drawing blood. I'm not giving them a novel uh, COVID vaccine. I'm just talking to people. Why do I need this oversight? Why do I need this regulation? Um, and action researchers, there's a group of social scientists who do action research. They change the protocol depending on the data they get. So we can't submit a proposal because we don't know what we're going to do. There are lots of practical answers for that question without completely dismissing research ethics. Um, and ethnographers, I had a very intense engagement with a group of Oxford ethnographers in Kenya. Basically, they move into communities and they start documenting what they see, you know, like Margaret Mead and other people did at the turn of the last century. And I said, oh, you do espionage. You go and spy on people because they don't know that you're doing it. I think it's massively unethical. And they say, yeah, but if we tell people what, what we're doing, their behavior's going to change. I said, well, you've got to work around that somehow. Um, they say journalists don't get ethics approval. And this guy, Alistair McIntyre, just had a wonderful response to that. And he says, some really terrible social science research is a lot like journalism, actually. So, um, and then social scientists say a lot of our stuff is minimal risk. So what's your design? Are we going to, uh, we want to interview victims of gender-based violence. What are the risks? Um, and it'll help them if to talk about, it'll help them to talk about the experience. They say, are you at? trained counselor, are you doing therapy with him? No, no, we just want to know the experience. Well, I said that is not going to be therapeutic. It might be re-traumatizing those people. Oh. Um. Okay, so, and then there's some other things, like um, the duplication. If you have a multi-site study that you're doing in Stellenbosch and Joburg and Pretoria and Blum, do you really need five ethics committees to look at it? And my answer is no. Really, the ethics committees must get their act together and agree on a single overarching uh, review and grant each other reciprocity. Ethics committees also have to learn to trust each other um, and not say, well, you know, Stellenbosch committee is the only one really we trust. Uh, so there are pragmatic solutions and I think RECs need to start implementing some of those. And Ethics chairs also need to start talking to each other. Ethics committees, I'm throwing in a few things here, but are also not editors. You know, you get a 12-page report on all the grammar and the spelling mistakes in the protocol. It should never be more than one line. Um, and also, what I say to my committee is you're only allowed to comment on grammar and spelling if it obscures the meaning of what is being proposed. If you can't understand it, then it must be rewritten. If the rest is just bad writing, it's not worth a lot of time. So most of this stuff is based on anecdotes, um, is based on feedback to chairs, but there is in fact some data on social scientists' attitudes towards ethics and ethics review. And I don't know if this is good or bad, but at least three studies that were done in the US and Australia show that in principle most social scientists are not opposed to ethics review, um, and the studies found between 40 to 74 percent of acceptance that their work should be ethically reviewed. We did a little study here some time ago, and only 42 percent were really unhappy with ethics review. And in fact, most of the objections that were raised in these studies were about the pragmatics, the delays, and the stuff like that. 
They were not in principle opposed to being reviewed. There's also the question of exemptions. I think some committees are still reviewing stuff that qualifies to be exempted. A lit review, a systematic review, it doesn't need ethics review. If this data is all in the public domain, it's exempted, and ethics committees need to be quicker to exempt that stuff. But medical records are not in the public domain. Um, academic records are not in the public domain. So even though they're documents, they're about living people and they need ethics review. So what sort of a model, and this is just where I want to end very quickly, um, is useful. And the, the irony is that it's a model that was written really for doing clinical trials in developing countries. And it's become my go-to toolbox when I talk to social scientists, when I talk obviously to people running clinical trials, when they ask us to troubleshoot stuff for them, this is the, the single most useful intellectual toolbox. And it's really just got eight points. And if you remember these eight points, you will be a research ethics consultant. And they're really very simple. Um, and I'll go through them in a bit more detail quickly, and then I'll be done. The first one is do some homework. Engage with your stakeholders. So if you're going to do research on pregnant teenage moms, go and chat to them first. And by the way, you don't need ethics permission to go and talk to them. Um, it'll inform your studies. They'll start to say, this is what we struggle with. We can't get the grants, or the dads are violent, or our parents don't understand, or the clinics give us terrible service. That when we go for service, we get lectures about not, not having sex. <clears throat> so your, show that your uh, research is not just from your head, but that it's engaged already with the stakeholders that you hope to do the research with. Um, and it'll make your research better informed. And I have to say, this week I got a letter from a British Ethics Committee saying, we don't allow stakeholder engagement until the person's got ethics approval. That's just really stupid. Um, you, you're preventing a researcher from going to talk to people about possibly doing a study you don't need ethics approval for that, in my view. Um, and there are wonderful resource documents. They come from biomedicine, but you can poach, you can steal ideas from them. They tell you how to engage with communities. It's 40 pages on how to have conversations with communities. And there's a lot of work going on at the moment looking at getting the dosage right. Because if you're going to run a five-year clinical trial, or maybe a five-year social science intervention project to improve school performance in children, then you have to have quite an intensive engagement exercise. But if you're going to do a little survey of toothbrushing behavior by four-year-olds, you really don't need to have six months of community engagement before you can run a little questionnaire. Uh, I should make it a social science example. Um, some questionnaire on some bit of social behavior that might be health-related. You don't need a big, fat community engagement program. So dosing it and getting it right and appropriate for the intensity of the research procedures and the intensity of your engagement with the community, that requires good judgment. And your ethics committee should actually help you with that and get it right. The research must have some social value. The researcher needs to say, how they think the data is going to contribute to social good. Um, we can have complicated philosophical and political conversations about whose version of society and which social values, um, but that is beyond the average research ethicist. The, the applicant just needs to say how they think their data will be beneficial, how might it be used. And of course, researchers shouldn't overpromise. We get Postgrad students doing this all the time. That if we know how many 15 year olds are suicidal, there will be less suicides in the community. Well, there's a missing piece. The missing piece is who's going to do the intervention based on the data. Um, the science has to be good. And we get massive complaints to say, what is your, why are you messing with the science? Why are you messing with your job is to do the ethics, not the science? Well, the science is part of the ethics. Because if the science is wrong, 
you are wasting people's time and effort. That's unethical. If the science is poor, the data could mislead future practitioners. Um, so ethics committees have to be sure that the design is correct, that the methodology is correct. And I have to say that a lot of social si uh, ethics committees are, are poor on social science methodology, so that you need qualitative researchers on your committee to be able to properly review qualitative studies. And you don't want to send questions back to the PI saying, your sample size is really small. What you're going to learn from seven mothers? Um, well, if it's qualitative, seven might be a lot. Um, is there a good match between the qualifications of the investigating team and the research questions being answered? So we're strong on transdisciplinarity and multidisciplinarity and so on, but there are some procedures that are professionally reserved for some sectors of the professional community, and those services need to be properly delivered by properly trained people. It's not a kind of a free-for-all. Um, so if your questions are about mental health, um, but you're a sociologist or an anthropologist, I think you should have a mental health professional on your team. You might not like it, but if, if you're moving into the mental health sphere, you need to be upskilled in those areas or properly advised by those professions. I'm nearly done. <clears throat> Um, your participants must be properly selected to suit your research question. And that sounds like a no-brainer. But what it means is we should move away from convenient samples, that you don't just sample medical students or psychology students because they're here. They're captive. If your question isn't about medical students or about psychology students, don't use those samples. Use the sample, find a sample that matches your research, research questions. Um, and that applies to prisoners, mental illness, and so on. All of you will be familiar with this, but the, the study must have a favorable research benefit ratio, that the risks must be minimized, and you must foresee the risks. There are risks in social science research. Social scientists keep saying there are no risks. If you're asking someone who's a victim of gender-based violence, about the traumas that she or he has had. Um, there are risks of distress. There are risks of somebody being destabilized. They might go home and harm themselves. They might not go home. Um, and I think a lot of particularly new social scientists researchers think that they're smart by just saying no risks. And what we say is that no thought. You have not thought about your participants. You've not thought about your research question. If a student writes all the worst possible risks, we are more likely to approve it because it shows that the investigator has, has got awareness and has got moral sensitivity um, to the issue. And there are different levels of risks. And the one thing I would also say is that research ethics committees must apply the standard definition of minimal risk. We don't want ad hoc opinions. Well, in my neighborhood, this happens, and I don't think it's right. And this is not minimal risk. There is an international definition of minimal risk that ethics committees must apply. It's not the place for idiosyncratic um, personal biases and personal prejudices. Um, so you've got to think about the magnitude of the harm, how big is the harm that might arise, and what is the probability of it happening. And those are two variables that ethics committees have to balance and that researchers have to try to balance. And they need to show evidence in their proposal that they have tried to balance these tensions. Um, that's pretty much what I've said. Um, yeah, so my last point too, that the worst thing is to try to hide the risks because we just read that as no thinking has happened. Um, that it should be reviewed by an independent committee, and that's a layer of oversight, somebody who's not involved in the study, just to give an independent opinion on whether it's good or bad. Um, the REC should also comply. Its behavior is also not above scrutiny, and I believe very strongly, and I know that this university supports that very strongly, 
that you know, the RECs are also social structures that must be open to independent study and independent observation. They're not some private cabal um, or some sort of mafia that is not available to be scrutinized. We should also allow ourselves to be looked at. Um, institutions that support their committees, and I know this one really does, and fortunately mine also does. Um, and there's some tips for applicants. Um, instead of seeing the ethics committee as an enemy or a rival, consider it a partner. It's going to make your research better. Um, read the form. Answer the questions properly. You're more likely to get through with an approval. Keep it friendly. Um, again, this is anecdotal, but for me, the, the, I've worked, fortunately, with some really world-class, award-winning, top-level researchers. And these people know how to work cooperatively. They are not the people that give me headaches. The people that give me headaches are recent PhDs um, who think that, they are, that I'm standing in the way of their Nobel Prize, and who the hell are you to be impeding my future research design? And they don't know how to form a relationship with the ethics chair to say, will you work with me? Will you help me do good research? <clears throat> um, so we've got some tips. Um, there is a huge literature on research ethics. People don't read. Uh, if you have a research ethics question as a social scientist, um, Google it, you know, and you'll find four articles, actually, of people that have struggled with the same problem and have got a way forward. People don't realize that there's a huge literature in research ethics that's there as a resource. Um, I'll skip this. Informed consent, I'm not even going to talk about because it's the first thing people say, what's research ethics about? Informed consent. So on the whole, researchers are not doing this too badly. So I'm not going to um, labor this. This one is an often neglected concern, and that is, have you thought about what happens after you've got your data? Well, I move on and I write up my PhD and luckily I get a job somewhere. Have you bothered to go and tell that community what you found? Um, have you shared the results with that community? Have you tried to make them, empower them with some of your data? Oh, I'll send them a copy of my thesis. No. Write a one-page handout. Write a little poster to put in the clinic um, or the school or wherever you did your study. Um, go back to the community that you consulted before you did the study and say, here's what we found. I hope it can be helpful to you. Um, so don't just drop them. The one thing, this is for ethics committees that review studies that I, I think is a tip from a standard handbook, is if you read reviews often, I think it is a place where reviewers can indulge some of their hobby horses. And one of the things that brings you back to the real world is to say, is the suggestion that I want to make or is the critique that I want to give going to significantly improve the safety and welfare of the participants? And if the answer is no, my suggestion is drop your question. Don't waste people's time with that question. Or put it as something to think about, but not as a condition. Um, the bottom line is the queries from the Ethics Committee should be there to improve the welfare and the safety of participants. Use the guidelines. Be friendly. I'm talking to ethics committees now who review social science research. Um, no conspiracy theories. Um, you must be able to defend your query with reference to an, an ethics guideline or a framework. Try and standardize your review uh, process. Chairs should talk to each other. It took the COVID pandemic for ethics chairs around the country to start phoning each other on a Sunday night and say, what the hell are we going to do, guys? And we developed the most wonderful, facilitative and supportive collaboration. Before that, silence, competition, UCT does their thing, UKZN does their thing, Stellenbosch does their thing. And we developed this massive, very supportive uh, network that we kind of miss now that the pandemic is pretending to be gone. Um, talk to the PI. Don't just write 20 pages. Phone him and say, don't understand this, don't understand this. 
Use expedited review as often as possible. Don't put a very simple proposal about toothbrushing behavior through a full committee review. It's inefficient use of resources, time, and effort. So I think the eight-point model will help researchers, it will help ethics committees, it will help us get to evidence-based data sooner. And I've got a few concluding comments that I'm really going to skip because I think I'm over time. Thank you very much, and I want to close by just saying to Mariana, it's been a great pleasure working with you over 20 years. I don't think we've had any big fights, um, and I look forward to another 20 with you. Thanks, colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. No, I think it's an excellent talk in, in, in ethics and medical ethics. Um, it highlights many of the problems we face with. Um, I think that we fear a lot of things in life, but one of the biggest fears when you send something to ethics and you get that letter back and email and you have to open it. So, <laughs> it's a reality. Um, any specific questions for Professor now? Can I just perhaps ask, I mean, we all lived through the COVID pandemic and, and obviously a lot of research was, was done during that time. Do, I mean, and, and, a, and from our perceptions, um, it was a bit quicker of getting a, a proposal accepted of review. So do you think the, the COVID pandemic has changed the way ethic committees look at research? Do you think it will have a lasting effect? And when, if you compare it to other major incidents in the world that happened, how, how does this COVID pandemic compare to previous major world incidents? Thanks very much for the question. Um, I think that's a paper we need to write as ethics chairs around the country. Um, what did we learn? Um, and what we learned is that our normal procedures are really slow and really cumbersome and that we were overly respectful of each institution's autonomy. Um, can you hear? And we were overly respectful about each institution's privacy and autonomy. Wonderful, thanks. Oh, thank you. Um, and that we do need to reflect on that exercise to see what we did that worked, and how can those learnings be implemented going forward? And apparently the National Health Research Ethics Council is doing exactly that. So the one big thing is reciprocity, that committees need to be willing to recognize approval by another one. And to say, if it's been approved at Stellenbosch, why do we need to review the whole thing again? What is the added value? And that will speed up socially relevant interventions. That's the one thing. Short of that, we could also just share our reviews. So even if each committee issues its own approval, I can send my review to Stellenbosch or UCT saying, here's what we thought, use it or leave it. Even that is a big difference to what we currently do. Um, and we need to look at how best to speed up at the, in the public's best interest, but without compromising safety. And that's the bottom line, without compromising safety. And certainly the committees around the country very quickly learned that you do that by doing the same full review process, but you don't wait for the December meeting or the January meeting. We can have a meeting, my committee had a meeting on a Sunday night uh, on Zoom, and the PR got their decision on Monday morning um, because it was urgent. But the process was still the same. And reviewers were willing to step up in the interest of national safety and security. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? James, Prof. Luke. context of, of the South African uh, tertiary hospital and academic institution. And of course, we, are, um, we want to do research, but there's a tremendous burden of work. Um, and, we have and, and our registrars are, in fact, obliged to do research. 
um, and they have a very short period of time. And their, their main focus is on passing their exams and getting out of the system. Um, so it's, it's a, and, and, and finally, clinical research is, in my opinion, medical clinical research is extremely difficult. Um, and um, so I liked a lot about what you said about pragmatism, because um, I think there is a situation where, where um, bu bureaucracy, a, a, a cumbersome system, um, and perhaps an undue focus on things that really are not major uh, ethical issues, that are more editorial issues, tend to bog down the process so that um, we need to get somebody having their sort of protocol through within six months of joining the division. They've then got a period of time in which to do the work and then to finish it. And um, I, I would like to pose the question of whether, in fact, the randomized control trial is dead because of ethics. Um, it becomes so difficult and so cumbersome, and you have to you have to have had you have have to have gone and had a training program and be accredited to do the, a, a randomized control trials. And, and these things, so so there's almost a point at which um, I think that an undue focus on bureaucracy and ethics, we know the world's going through that stage, is in itself unethical because it suppresses innovative uh, research and things like randomized control, control trials. Yeah, the Department eventually says, well, fine, we'll just, we'll just do a retrospective uh, series, et cetera. So, so do you think there's a, do you think that we've, so I, I maybe more of a lecture than a question, but um, do, you think that, do you think that we've, we, that we can, we get to the, uh, beyond the balance and where in fact, um, it becomes a bit unethical to be so restrictive in, in how we run our committees. Thanks for the question. And I, I touched on some of those themes. Uh, frankly, I do think for a postgrad degree, uh, a randomized control trial is probably setting the bar too high. And that what we would say to the supervisor and the student is, do a pilot study of some kind, do a proof of concept study. Because an RCT, the numbers you need, just forget about the ethics committee, but just scientifically um, are huge and expensive. And the obligations ethically and otherwise to do it properly are, are daunting. But it doesn't mean that you can't do a little interventional proof of concept study, uh, which would do for a master's and might even do for a PhD. Um, so I think that is true. and. Because if you're going to do an RCT, you have to do it properly. And I think that would be beyond the scope of the average postgraduate uh, student. But you can still do very meaningful uh, proof of concept studies and very meaningful observational studies, which you called uh, retrospective. They don't have to be retrospective. They can be prospective. And one little mechanism that we have found that might work in your setting, because we have lots of uh, clearly public health facilities and quite a lot of research-minded um, heads of departments. And what we encourage them to do is to open what we call a class approval, where they get ethics approval to use their clinical data as research data. And then when they get a registrar, the registrar can do an analysis with their own question of that already approved data set. Uh, without a six months wait for ethics approval. So there's a pre-approved data set. And to say registrar A is just going to look at febrile side effects in that data set or surgical side effects in that data set. And that's good enough for a master's. Mm -hmm. And it's obviously, it's often very social, socially valuable data and that no one has mined before. Thank you. Thank you. So we move on to our second speaker this morning, uh, Prof. Dani Lombard, uh, and his talk is the evolution of mentorship program. So he's an expert in classic philosophy. Uh, he specialized in Greek tragedy, that's not Tigerberg Hospital, and philosophy. He is fluent in numerous languages, including Zulu, German, Greek, Latin, Hebrew. 
In the last years, he's researched the, the comparison between oral tradition of the ancient Greeks and modern Zulu oral culture. And when he retired as head of classic languages at UNISA, UP began to employ him for language courses, and eventually he found his way into the medical faculty with renewal of a curriculum and turned out to be excellent mentor. He's been doing this for the last 20 years and still appointed as a mentor. Uh, he has run a very successful mentoring program and he can integrate uh, cultures extremely well. He's also assisted the government with the integration of um, Nelson Mandela students nationally. So we welcome Prof Lombard. Clearly this is not a pulmonology meeting because the words in these bios is far too many. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Prof Kusa. I, for listening to that, I just wondered, I, I recognize some of the things in myself. Some, some are indeed true, otherwise maybe a bit highly spun indeed. It's a great pleasure to be able to take part in honoring my friend and respected colleague, Prof Mariana Greer, this way. The presentation will form the very diametrical opposite because it's going to concentrate on tuition. So what one has learned in research, how one is going to impart that knowledge on uh, to other people. The presentation will take the following uh, parts from mentor to mentorship, the relevance of mentorship, the evolution of mentorship at UP, and the program, the actual program, and then I'll conclude. Okay. The process of learning is the essence of our human reality. From birth, we learn from our parents, our teachers, and if we are fortunate enough to enter a tertiary institution from our lecturers. The term mentor primarily denotes an older person guiding a mentee, a younger person, and the concept mentorship very often elicits negative reactions, because very often one hears, what is this now? Mentor, the, in the old days, in my generation, we had to focus on academic excellence, uh, the, the fittest survive, this mentorship simply is an unnecessary uh, addition to our practice. It is going to promote dependence and inhibit autonomous learning. That is the traditional. And yet if we trace the, um, the history of mentor and mentorship, we find that it is actually firmly rooted in medical education. Now, mentor appears as a proper name uh, in 900 BC. Uh, Odysseus left his son Telemachus in the care of his trusted friend called Mentor. However, Mentor doesn't seem to have done his work very well because when Odysseus 20 years later comes back, after his trials and tribulation, he finds his palace in a state of total disarray. The concept, the proper name mentor, then emerges 2,000 years later in uh, the political novel of François Fenelon. It will be in Les Aventures de Télémaque. And here, he appears in a far more active role as guide, advisor, second father. Uh, the novel was published into German, English, and all the Germanistic languages, uh, Romanistic languages. It was extremely popular. And then the proper name became the noun. And denoting an older person, uh, providing guidance, 
motivational, uh, motivation simply, emotional support, and indeed even role modeling. Okay, the guiding process of a mentee is subsumed under the abstract term mentorship. But this term became popular, became current only in the 1970s, especially in business and in educational contexts. But to understand it, uh, the extensive youth of mentoring today, both generally and particularly in medicine, we can actually go back to the oath of Hippocrates, which dates back to 400 before the Common Era. Now, I don't want to reduce you to a learning lesson, but the first statement after the appeal to the several gods is important there. To hold him, who has taught me, I, I quote fully because it's very controversial, these lines. To hold him who has taught me this art is equal to my parents and to live my life in partnership with him. And if he is indeed in need of money, to give him a share of mine and to regard his offspring as equal to my brothers in my lineage and to teach them this art without fear and covenant. To give a share of these precepts and oral instruction and all the other learning to my sons and to the sons of him who has instructed me and to pupils who have signed the covenant and have taken an oath according to the medical law, but to no one else. Um, students don't like this, the financial aspect here. Okay, now these lines uh, have been controversial, and they have been, uh, they've come uh, in various uh, mutations that have been uh, transmitted to us. Uh, in directly after the World War, I will maintain by all the means of my power, the honor and noble tradition in the medical profession, my colleagues will be my brothers. Predictably, this was changed in 1994. My colleagues will be my brothers and sisters. And then when one had become used to the change, the gender neuter uh, undertaking, I will give to my teachers, colleagues and students the respect and gratitude that is their due. The restatements exclude the economic restraints of the original and the undertaking, and is limited, it is limited to a moral appeal for respect and solidarity amongst medical practitioners. But the original dates back, what was the implication of those uh, of the financial uh, implications, what, what were they? It, the oath was formulated at a time when the uh, school of Hippocrates was opened up to the general public. Before the art of healing was the family property of uh, the Asclepidae, the, the uh, family of Asclepius. Uh, but there was great demand for the art of healing, so it was opened up to more people, but of course now there had to be financial guarantees. So this oath would have been sworn not by the family members, but by the new members who were not part of the Asclepidae. So it's as simple as that. The oath guarantee, uh, offered uh, financial guarantees and also uh, gave the precepts of the art of, med of learning and teaching to the students. Now, in what sense, if any, is this relevant today? Um, current relevance. Uh, if we look at the articles on medical education in academic medicine, med uh, medical education, and teaching and learning in medicine, we find that articles abound on mentorship. Um, it is almost strange that it is now roundabout, it was from the 90s that all these articles appeared. They stress the value of mentorship 
in uh, sensitizing people to the hidden curriculum, professionalism, and the ethical values. They also extol uh, competitive, uh, uh, cooperative values rather than competitive ones as the cooperative values alleviates uh, the stress leading to burnout. However, they also lament uh, the lack of institutional engagement resulting from the hierarchical organization uh, in medical schools. Now, this very problem led me to call the presentation, uh, the present presentation, the evolution of a mentoring system in the School of Medicine at UP. And I would like to share my personal experience. It's not really anecdotal because it did have resonance ultimately. Uh, <clears throat> in deconstructing this hierarchy and involving various departments in mentoring. And I would like to show that it has been a very gratifying process, actually. Okay, the mentorship, the mentoring program, which it was called later, actually, started in a situation of crisis in 2001. A new curriculum was phased in by the end of the 90s, and as often happens, no proper transitional arrangements had been made. The result was 17 students made it right to the end of the old curriculum, but then failed surgery, and I'm sorry to have to say pediatrics too. Um, it caused a particular problem in as much as um, these students were all of indigenous uh, descent and it highlighted an educational gap resulting from our tragic racist history. It brought this gap strongly into focus. The fact that I was requested to assist in addressing the problem was a matter of coincidence, which is best explained in a, another context. It was entered to in that very generous introduction. Um, the, I loved working with these 17 students, but I had to get the, the trust and credibility on two fronts, on the part of the students on the one hand, who believe that this is gross discrimination. On the part of the lecturers, because they felt I was undermining academic standards. So I had to navigate my way between three roles, a mediator, facilitator, and mentor. But this experience culminated in great, great academic success because at the end of an extended semester, seven, uh, the, all those students not only passed, but they passed with an average of 70%. So this experience did underline the necessity to get the institutional commitment to allow academic success of all students who form part of our demography. I come to the different, and, and this program has been the result of discovering and the gap and then implementing, at least doing something, as Professor Vassanot showed before. You diagnose the problem, then try to resolve the problem. I come to the different elements of the study support. In the first year, because I have the conviction of Jesuits, get them at an early age and you've got them for life. So in the first year, what we do is offer language and study, uh, language study and emotional uh, support. Then second phase, coordination through a tutor program, individual support, 
and finally oral uh, preparation for examinations in the student intern complex. The student intern complex forms the last 18 months of the MBCHB curriculum. In the first year study, the students firstly do um, language support, and Prof. Kriya did alert me to the fact nobody is going to know what tall is, and I cannot understand why I did not write it out, but I'll explain exactly what it is. The students do the tall test, which is a test of academic literacy levels. It is, has been developed in Potchefstroom, and I have a feeling some linguists of Stellenbosch were also involved, and it actually became an ex excellent instrument to measure the level of academic proficiency. There is one for Afrikaans, but since the teaching language is English at the University of Pretoria, the academic English is tested in that. Now, the students who are uh, identified as at risk then have to do these ELH modules. And ELH is the word that I selected. It simply means English language for health. Um, we need to have, some, we're allowed to have only three little, this, but it would have helped if I explained it. It's simply English language for health. Now, what I did there is I looked at, in the first semester, as in all the uh, MBCHB curricula, some uh, subjects are done in the natural science faculty, the others in humanities. And in humanities, they have to do medical sociology and philosophy. Philosophy is concerned with methods. So these two modules offer an excellent opportunity to introduce the students to academic language and academic thinking. So, what they need to do here is they're given vocabulary lists, but they do not lead, learn the vocabulary in isolation. They have to study them in context of their prescribed work. And then for comprehension, they have to do closed tests. I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with closed tests. It's simply we, I, we take certain sentences from the prescribed work and leave out key concepts. And the students have to fill in the key concepts from a basket of several concepts. So it's an excellent test mm. for academic literacy, which in the first semester, based on those two disciplines, then on this, in the second semester, based on what we call block one, which is a combination of anat anatomy, physiology, genetics, everything possible. And there also, now, it'll concentrate on medical vocabulary. And the same happens, tested through uh, closed tests. However, I now come to the more demanding uh, holistic support which is given to students. In the first year, first semester, they have to write a biographical essay. The reason for that is it gives one a shortcut to construct the academic profile of the class as a whole, but also to see where there are problems, individual problems. If one looks at the profile as a whole, these students come from a various dem demography, from no homogenous uh, demography, as is our de demography in South Africa. Roughly differentiated rural township and uh, rural, at least urban township rural. Now, students from rural uh, townships or rural areas have the most uh, problems. They find difficulty in expressing themselves as fluently as the urban counterparts. Uh, so from the, they're inhibited from the beginning. 
One actually has to work quite hard. But more importantly, if you look at these biographical essays, one regularly sees that there is a lack of identifying with a role model, a paternal or a maternal figure in the family. Uh, this problem has gained new significance since a statistical report in 2021 was published. It showed the absence of the biological uh, father in the various groupings. Uh, one sees that 31.7% black children stay with their uh, biological fathers, compared with 51% of colored, 86% of Asian and Indian children, and 80.2% 80 of white children. So Indian, Indian and, and, and uh, Asian actually higher than the whites, 86 as compared to 80%. Mothers, grandmothers, and aunts take care of between 74 and 92% of children across all race groups. Um, then the psychosocial effects of a lack of staying with a biological father uh, are discussed in rural areas. Specifically, it was in, in was it was it in Pumalanga or, or West? I'm not sure, I'm not sure now. But it appeared in Stellenbosch Theological Journal, right here at this university in 2013, the third volume one. I saw it after uh, putting on the slides, I'm sorry. Uh, how do I attempt to discuss, uh, the, uh, to treat this problem? Well, no, it's not. Oh, yes, sorry. Students have to submit time management sheets in which they uh, have to write, submit it every week, and there they've got to distinguish between the time they spent in study, homework, or whatever, the time they spend in actually preparing themselves for simply washing, eating, etc., and then the happy time. They've got to, they've got three categories in which to fill in. Now, this sounds like excessive control, but it was derived from our observation that there is, and we know, there is no culture of homework in townships whatsoever. Um, the parents are away, anyway, working normally, and the parents mostly are illiterate, anyway. So this offers some kind of structure. Then finally, what I used to do is I had the entire class which was uh, especially the ones in these modules which I mentioned. Photographs of them, because that gave one uh, the opportunity to address them uh, by name, and it had the personalizing effect of developing mutual respect and trust, because one also very often has to deal with very, very uh, sensitive problems, and indeed, I say this, uh, this aspect of mentoring is the most demanding, and it lasts from the first to the final years. The second phase is coordination through a tutor program. This would be the most structured program. Select tutors are invited in the second year of study. That is after they, had, they themselves had had a full year of tutorship because the tutors start uh, tutoring during the second semester and until, until the end of the second year, but I talk also in the third year. These tutors are selected through the most rigorous process. First of all, they've got to uh, supply a written application. Normally, I get about 80 applications. 
And from that, 40 students are invited to offer an ideal tutor class. Uh, the select panel for that would consist of so myself, obviously, the, a class representative and experienced tutors. And they are very strict to their younger counterparts, I can tell you. About 20 students are selected then. Then quality control is assured because I attend all those tutor classes, but in very close coordination with the other tutors and with the class representative, they get daily critiques on a WhatsApp group. Um, these critiques always tend to be most constructive. Obviously, one doesn't want to inhibit the people. And I emphasize the solidarity of the tutor group because what we achieve is a collective success. Uh, so on a daily basis. And then, ultimately, the, by the end of their third year, the students do get a reward. The eight best students are chosen to attend an elective abroad for at the university, at the Freie Universität in, in, in Amsterdam, and four at the University of Tromso in Norway. So this is truly really a great reward, and th it becomes quite uh, a status symbol to be a tutor in this grouping. I come to the individualized uh, support. The relationship of trust, as I've mentioned, is already established from the first year, and one treats the widest range of possible physical and emotional problems. Students are very creative. I thought I wouldn't, I was too old to learn something new. However, there's always something. They come up with something new. And when I can't cope with the problems, I naturally refer to psychologists and psychiatrists. But the relationship with the individual students is symmetrical and maintained throughout life. Oh, I could just explain. The two precepts which I have followed in my own life has one come from a Zulu tradition and the other from my studies in Germany. In Zulu, you've got the proverb, it is respected on two fronts. So respect comes from two sides. Simply, respect is mutual. And then my own doctor father in Germany used to emphasize that the best pedagogue is the image you give to a student of him or herself. So that has been very important in my own experience and development. I've finally come to the final year. Um, oral preparation for, for the examinations and the SIC does denote the student intern complex. Now the students are now divided into smaller groups which allow interactive uh, teaching because it now, the training in the SIC, the training is focused on clinical training, naturally, and communication is of the utmost importance there. Um, and I know nothing about gynecology and obstetrics, but I was requested to assist, and I get a memo normally of this OSPI, and then sit with the students. And the situation is a recreation of the examination situation where the examiner is the ill lady and the students have to elicit from her exactly what the problem is to ultimately come to a diagnosis and management plan. So it is an excellent form of teaching language competence and clinical reasoning. Obviously, language competence because They've got to uh, communicate on different levels depending on 
the station or the lady, the socio-economic, uh, cultural uh, sensibility of that individual. Uh, then, most importantly, they will then have to elicit it. And, of course, it's obvious that this is an excellent uh, form of training in an analyzing the different aspects of the info and then synthesizing. The skills taught is application of clinical knowledge through listening, analyzing, and synthesizing. Um, I was requested to do this for the Nelson Mandela Fidel Castro students who come from Cuba and they, who have been coming in increasing numbers to the University from Pretoria, of Pretoria from about 2008, however, in, in great numbers from 2018. However, because the students realize that the OSPs which, which I offered, now I've got to take some credit for that, I suppose, is, um, are quite helpful. So at the moment, they, the OSPs are attended by 40 to 80 students in a session. That, did I say 80? I didn't mean that. 30 to 40 students, because those would be the students doing that particular clinical rotation. And of these 40 students, about five to six would be uh, Nelson Mandela Fidel Castro students. The others are UP students. And frankly, I do not see an enormous discrepancy here because the discipline knowledge is far higher amongst the UP students. However, to practically apply that in a clinical case, is incredibly difficult. <laughs> it demands a great deal of tolerance. I do shout at them and I tell them that I found that abuse is the best pedagogue. So I do tell them they're not, they're not doing well at all. Um, but it has been successful because at the end of this effort, what one sees over the last two years, the uh, ops gynae, rotation is either promoted or in the end passed by almost all the students. It is the, the uh, rotation in which the student achieved the greatest academic uh, uh, success. Well, it's time to conclude. Um, I have said that developing this mentorship program does take the commitment of the institution as a whole. And it has helped to identify a common goal, academic success for everybody involved, and uh, to actually finally convince the authorities that this program is useful and is needed. The Tutor program, for example, clashed my slow introduction of that tutor program, did take some convincing because the tutors traditionally were postgraduate students who the district heads appointed. But what they did not realize is that these students were far removed from the reality of a first and second and third year student. So they, they didn't communicate and interact properly. When it comes to the OSCEs, what my next task will be, a true desideratum, is to convince the different uh, heads of the rotations that OSPs can be very successful in training. So ultimately what one needs to do is show that to convey knowledge, you don't only have to be a specialist, you also have to be a sensitive teacher, and that's all. Funding or naturally is inquired, but especially now with the financial constraints we have, 
However, I must say that uh, at the University of Pretoria I've had, I cannot complain, proper funding was provided for the tutors and uh, as it is, there are other advantages in being a tutor and then I was ultimately also allowed to, to appoint an administrative assistant because it will be obvious that an, it involves an enormous workload, this program. Uh, the language study in the first semester has also been taken over by a language unit. I'm not always happy with it, but it is in flux. But ultimately, what we are looking for is success, academic success, and high professional standards. But this program is always in flux, in construction, as it responds to changing student needs. I thank you for your attention. <laughs> Questions are happy. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Dani, for this excellent lecture. I don't know why Mariana waited 14, 15 years before inviting you here. <laughs> it is absolutely brilliant. Um, any questions? I think I can say from we, we are we are all, we are supposed to sorry, Prof. Uh, we are mentors supposed to be mentors of registrars and uh, other people. But I think one of the personal problems is as we're probably a generation that wasn't really mentor. So now suddenly to mentor someone else where you actually don't actually have the skills to do it, it's actually quite difficult. And I mean, it's not in everyone's shoes to be a natural mentor. Uh, Prof, I don't know how to answer that. Um, I, s I, I, s I suppose we don't all have equal interactive skills. Um, but, but they always in a discipline of people who realize that discipline knowledge is, and to be a specialist, in, a knowledge specialist doesn't mean you're a teaching specialist. So there are always people committed to teaching. It is the dichotomy in academia. We are rewarded because of our research, but the teaching component is not uh, quantified when it comes to, to reasons for being promoted or not. There is a dichotomy there. Thank you. Yeah. Prof. Mulder? Okay, yes, I, I did hear the question very much so. As I said, slowly, uh, well, first of all, that tutor system did not exist. And now, everybody, in the beginning there was resistance. Now we, it has such great success. I noticed my colleagues in the School of Medicine boasting everywhere, we've got the best tutor system in the entire university. So it's totally integrated in the institution. When it comes to the later years, uh, two in the fourth year is not a problem, but in the student intern complex, uh, there is a lot of study support in, uh, offered by the individual disciplines. But uh, a short answer to that question is very much so. It's had a terrific impact, in fact. Uh, the, there could be a problem, maybe, and this is not to praise myself, it's a little bit too centered around me. To get somebody who's older and is prepared to do all this work is not easy. That, uh, because the rewards are not so great, but the rewards, I mean, the, the tangible rewards are not so great. But the rewards in terms of seeing success, academic success, and seeing a, a, an integrated student body of all races, that is very, very uh, encouraging. 
and gratifying. Yes, um, language is a very important medium too. I didn't bring that in uh, because it becomes a bit long. But at the end of the first module, which they do in the second year, we are allowed to teach. Uh, the students have to do a, a choice of sepedi, is Zulu or Afrikaans. Originally, the idea was to, uh, the students need to learn sepedi. Uh, at that point, I intervened and I said, no, no. Uh, Sepedi is a regional language, but you don't know where you're going. The student might decide to go to a Zulu-speaking or Tosa-speaking uh, area, for that matter. And I insisted that many of the indigenous students want to learn Afrikaans. So they've got a choice of these three languages. And that actually creates an important, barri uh, important bridge between the different cultures. And I am allowed in the fourth year to teach uh, the students who do the neurotic, uh, neurology rotation, Isi Zulu. I, uh, th but that's also the result of personal contact with the head of, of neurology, Professor Kakaza, and um, <coughs> Professor Skutter. Ultimately, trust and the feeling that we are all part of the common bond of humanity and that that is expressed in language, whatever, but that different, the manifestation of it in language uh, differs, but the bond of humanity is common. And that is a message we try to convey. It is. Thank you. Any other questions? Then I'd just like to thank Prof. Dan for his excellent lecture, for attending today. Okay, our next speaker is Vera van Dahl. Uh, Vera is uh, from the Pediatric Oncology Support Coordinator from Cancer, TLC. So she and Prof. goes away a long time. Uh, so Vera's son was diagnosed with retinitis sarcoma by Prof. Kruger in a private practice in Pretoria. And after his passing, Vera decided to do outreach at the Children's Oncology Unit in Kalafong, and she later made this a natural and started Cancer TLC. And she being keen, she then began assisting all children at the different oncology units. Uh, she's now going to share her experience as a parent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Prof. Mariana, I've decided that um, I don't want to do a PowerPoint because I just want to share from the heart. So I want the opportunity to read you a letter. It might not be all appropriate, but I, I want to share. Uh, Prof. Mariana, it is 25 years since we've met in 1997, and it had a radical effect and outcome of my life. Your call to invite me as a guest speaker came as a pleasant surprise to share some of the personal experiences I had on the road that we as a family traveled with you. I would like to offer you a letter from my heart today. I feel privileged to have opportunity to give it with ever distinguished uh, guest uh, present to thank you today, but offer to offer one or two late apologies. I made a list of a few things that I would like to thank you for. The direct approach in which you had expectations of me as a parent, to be aware of our circumstances and dealing with advanced reptomyosarcoma. Your honest and open approach strengthened me, although it ruffled my fauna and flora a bit in the beginning. I remember that I experienced total hearing loss when you talked to my husband. 
And I remember him sitting next to you and you and him opening your mouths and gapping like fishes. And I realized that I had to nod my head in order not to look stupid. I had no recollection of any information offered during the first week. These memories of effects of shock on myself still helps me today in my approach and support of new patients. It is hard to acknowledge that I was an oncology parent from the 90s. As those who were the days slightly before technology, slightly before cell phones, and other technology. I remember with pride when my husband delivered to me a first used Siemens brick with an antenna so that I could call him in case of emergency. Some months afterwards, I received a first digital camera. We couldn't afford it then, but we simply had to make memories. Somehow, I knew that we lived on borrowed time. I think the first digital camera with 32 megapixels was launched in 1990 allowing us to capture a few more memories on a stiffy drive. It was more affordable than my 35 millimeter Minolta. This info, okay, this info makes it difficult to pretend that I can deduct from my age. You encourage us to read up as much as possible to study and then to sift between a lot of information. It was a challenge, but it was good because we had you. You were on our side, and between those painful experiences was my forever calling waiting to be discovered. From the beginning, you allowed me to ask questions and also to set up and manage occasional drips at home. And by the time this terminal situation knocked on the door, I was competent and qualified to handle and take care of Nickers. To the best of my ability, you walked the extra mile and were available to address my fears with every relapse we had. As a parent, you gave me room to learn and make mistakes and try again. But I do apologize for my very dry sense of humor that wasn't always appropriate. I remember the look on your face during one of our very early chemo sessions. You entered the ward. And just by the way, I mentioned that I believe the staff, staff might have switched little Tumi's chemo with Nikas's chemo. I thought you were ir ir immediately ready to explode and strangle someone. But you took a deep breath and calmly asked me why I think so. And then I showed you a few tiny black curly ha hairs reappearing on his bald, previously blonde head. You simply turned on your heels and left the room. I thought it was funny then. I guess it wasn't. I apologize. Thank you for accepting me. But more importantly, thank you for accepting Nikas and us as a family. In my heart, you will always be someone to look up to. And as he referred to you as my doctor, in a letter he wrote to you at age three, at his first effort of remission. We had a few challenges with his sister, who also, still small then, was allowed by you to sleep over in the ward over weekends when we the, were the only patients. The staff in the ward didn't help a lot because they treated her with chocolates, ice cream, and cake and made her feel that hospital is a very fancy place. I also appreciate the time when I started smuggling baby bunnies and an iguana into the ward. I was broken then, but I had to live the spirits of other kids. That was my coping mechanism. One of your young patients was moving quite a bit in his bed, but he pretended to be unaware when you entered the ward. You asked me something and I wasn't aware of anything, and then you just lift the blanket, let it fall back and said, I also can't see anything. I know that these kids were very special to you and you allowed quite a lot of us to cross the lines. Oncology brought on quite a lot of inappropriate humor. You accepted the invite from us as parents to have a barbecue with us immediately outside of a ward. 
Then I shared the communication a mom just had that day when she tried to prepare her little toddler for dying. The memory today is a gem. I want you to imagine a mom sitting there with a very, very difficult child, and very irritable, and complaining a lot. And his mom started shouting at him and saying, he must stop showing the middle finger to everybody. It won't be acceptable to show that to Jesus and angels. And because Jesus and the angels are coming to get him soon, he better start behaving and stop swearing also. Um, because he need to know that one day when she's going to be in heaven and Jesus or any angel tells her or informs her that he didn't behave, showed a middle finger or sweat, that she's going to smack his effing bat off. <laughs> you called me from somewhere in Europe when you discussed Nikos with a team more than once. You made another long-distance call when he passed. That meant everything to me. We could not have asked for more. I wish more would like to do that. Afterwards, your invitation to me to assist in Califong had a greater consequence than I and possibly you had foreseen. The upgrade and renovation of a ward with multiple medical goods Furniture and bathroom upgrades energized me into the next step of a total restoration of an old facility for the first 20 bed lodger facility at Califong. All came with lots of begging and pleading and fundraising. Nothing of the things done is up to today being subsidized by the government or any institution. All is fundraising. I again apologize for the few times I crossed protocol at Califong also due to lack of knowledge of all the political hospital rules, but maybe also because I realize that apologizing afterwards is a better option, faster and easier than tracking down all the parties who need to take responsibility. Many refused to accept that responsibility, and many were in limbo or pre rigor mortis until the work was completed and when they saw it, they were usually satisfied with the results. I do acknowledge and apologize for any or maybe many of your migraines I might have contributed to. You dancing with the kids on your 50th birthday party in California Ward 8 is also captured in my heart as a very beautiful moment. The planned move to Steve Biko led to years of negotiations to find a potential larger space and to get that building signed off. Although I was happy for your opportunity in Western Cape, it left us with a big void. You were motivation behind my drive to set up Nickers Lodge. The identified building was in a critical state of disrepair, occupied by a lot of squatters with no wiring, sewerage, um, and anything that existed. But with motivation and drive, your trust in me and my faith in the Lord's provision, it was transformed, according to my knowledge, into the largest single facility for pediatric oncology assistance in the country. Within a few months' time, several sponsors heard about the renovation and came on board to contribute to that facility's renovation. It's a three-story building, and initial renovation cost was close to two million rand. Um, it was achieved in eight months. This 50-building bed renovated facility now allows for accommodation of parents and uncles children free of charge. Although since COVID stretched challenges, we had a huge increase and influx to reduce the award challenges and had to add additional baby cots for lactating moms also. Terminal and seriously ill kids are supported by accommodation for both parents and children from far who cannot go home may stay over between treatments. Since launching this facility, we have been open 24-7 for 364 days a year, we are only three people working there. Ward admitted children may have private clothing and bedding, and parents are welcome to use our laundry facility even though they don't make space or uh, use of our facility in terms of accommodation. We also then supply the washing powder. 
Each child may ask for a food package to take home every time they dis are dismissed. It's not a one-time offer. This happens on a daily basis. Parents who have an unplanned stay, a long stay, or new families can ask for all their toiletries and clothing assistance if needed. At the time the move to Steve Biko took place, Cancer invited me to join them and roll out the TLC division for childhood cancer nationally. It allowed me then to visit Tiger Book Unit and through Anthea also then so offer support there. I was and still am responsible for managing the lodge, taking responsibility for online psychosocial counseling for our toll free service, general support, and then nationally still continue to raise funds and support for niche such as the prosthetic eyes, ports, Provex, and other special. Uh, challenges. In personal capacity, I grew a deep passion for Christian family or individual counseling and grief support. The support and donations at Nikos Lodge expanded in such a blessed way during COVID that now at this stage, on a weekly basis, I can offer huge bulk food parcels to four to eight other NGOs. That um, is a truly blessing. We have too much fresh food to keep for ourselves after all the mothers come and collect food parcels. I give the Lord all the credit for answering to our prayers. We are able to offer 60 to 75 food parcels home monthly and are humbled that we are able to work together to, work, to provide a nutritious composition so that the results can be part of Mrs. Kuman's research. After Nikos Lodge was established, I was privileged to negotiate with different sponsors for another one and a half million to restore an old building in Polokwane for a new pediatric oncology unit that opened in Lipopo under leadership of Dr. Wedi. Again, you were the drive who motivated to get him back, thus giving me the reason to start renovation of another ward. For the past three years since COVID in 2020, our accumulated stati statistics for Nikos Lodge are as follows. Occupied bed nights, 18,273. About half of the lodges will eat in the ward, which left us to offer 27,410 meals at the lodge over this past three year period. Food parcels sent home, excluding the bulk donations, is close to 2,000. Donations valued, uh, food offered was 1 million. 218,504 rand and 58 cents. With support of a special family, funds raised for ports, Broviax, and other prosthetics and emotional support since 2013 equals 3,41 million. Sorry, other people in government also make this <laughs> literacy mistake. I wish to acknowledge each sponsor and partner who believes in what we do. Some continue to make a huge impact, but in the bigger picture, Prof, if you haven't allowed me on board on your team in 2000, my life would have been much poorer. I feel rich for what I was able to do and still can contribute. I didn't lose my child because I know exactly where he is. I believe that I will see him again but through learning from Nikos, preparing a child and parent from a Christian spiritual level and making them look forward to heaven became my gifted passion. It is a blessed reward to dry the tears. I grew and gained for the benefit of many, many others. And for this, I thank you again for allowing me the opportunity and my gratitude and honor to Jesus for bestowing those blesses, blessings on Nikos Lodge. May you be richly blessed on the new direction you are taking forward. May every day be filled with goodness and opportunities. And I would like to offer an invite for any unit who is still in running short on Port Zimbroviak funding and budgets that we have sufficient for the next year to contribute to your wards. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vera, for sharing your personal journey um, and a significant role you have played in developing those units. Um, any questions for Vera? 
Thank you. Our next speaker. <laughs> our next speaker is Stella Milan, uh, and she's the mother of Stephanie, who's also here with us. And Stephanie was diagnosed with leukemia at the age of three years. And Stella will share experience with us and also a journey with Prof. So, since everybody knows that I don't really talk a lot, um, I am going to start talking so long. Um, yes, thank you. I've got uh, the updated presentation on here, and I think it's that cable that side, isn't it? Do we need it? Okay, then we do it on the. Prof Kruger taught us how to do make backup plans. You want this? Yeah. <laughs> I knew. I see the can't see on the key. Yeah, this is the solved thing. to put it and then just to leave that one. Hello everybody, um, my name is Stella and I am the mother of a beautiful little big girl, young woman by now, Stephanie, this is the reason why the first three letters are the same, st -a and st -a. Um, Stephanie was diagnosed at exactly two years, 11 months and one week with ALL on the 29th of November 1995. Our lives turned upside down completely. Um, there was another plan the Lord had for us. He brought us down one more time to our niece on the 14th of August 1998 with a relapse uh, again in ALL on the cerebrospinal fluids. Uh, we went back, we lived in Harry Smith at that point of time, and uh, you know, you think it's bad or it's tough when a doctor look you in the eye and say, okay, your child has got cancer. Your first, your first question is, what's the prognosis? Obviously, that is, you eagerly sit and await, and I think majority of the times the answers are the same. 50-50, man. Every child, even if they've got the same diagnosis, different prognosis. They can get the same um, medication, they can get the same um, protocol, uh, what, whatever, and they can, can react different. Right, so this was our, uh, our, our first day when we met with Prof Kruger. At the bottom, well, sorry, the first week after Stephanie was admitted, there at the bottom you can see a very young Prof Kruger in the middle, uh, standing with Stephanie and her sister, her sibling sister right next to her. And we were uh, having Stephanie's third birthday because we weren't sure if there's going to be a fourth. And Prof Kruger, thank you. You arranged that we could have it in the one children ward. We did move all the children out of that ward for that two, three 
uh, ours because Stephanie has uh, 16 cousins that was also uh, signing up at the hospital for the birthday party coming from all over. So at the top you'll see that is uh, Stephanie's sister, the sibling, and it was such a blessing to see the two sisters having fun in the bath. Uh, you can see she's, at that point of time, she had a Broviac portu and a Portugath. Uh, and when Prof Kruger comes in around with the checkups in the right-hand corner at the bottom, you will see dear Nikas. Nikas from Vera was Stephanie's best friend in the hospital. We always look at each other, other uh, mothers look at me, and they say, oh, Stella, you've been through such a tough time. I'm so glad I'm not you. I look at other mothers and I say, Lord, thank you. Because I didn't get the toughest. So uh, is, uh, is Nikas had a laptop and they, the two of them were conquering the world on Nikas's laptop. Stephanie was so privileged. Um, we used to call them the Brasso heads. If you see there, there's a reason those heads are pretty shiny. That's also when they start losing their eyebrows. Going to the next step was very important for me as a, as a mother. The sibling always had to come and visit. Now that is Yolanda, Yolanda and Stephanie, and you will see uh, Yolanda is the one with the Unitas t-shirt because um, Prof Kruger was so kind to also give the siblings a t-shirt so that they can be one with their sisters. In the right-hand corner at the top, you'll see Yolanda pushing Stephanie. Stephanie had a catheter in at that point of time. This, was a, this picture specifically was taken the second time round. I think um, uh, we, we might probably uh, be the reason why there was an extra few parkings built at Unitas. I think it came from, from this fund. Um, so that having a sibling, Prof Kruger also taught us, it's very important for the patient to have a sibling. And not just that, giving the sibling the same type of attention than what the pa little patient gets, because they don't always understand. They're also small. My, the two girls are like 14 months apart. Um, and even though Loli or Yolanda is the one with lots of hair, and Stephanie was always the one that had to give it up, um, they, the two of them also just grew closer and closer. It was tough to always greet um, Yolanda. She was in grade one, so she had to go back. At that time, we lived in Harry Smith, three hours drive. I must say, there was a certain period of time when, um, uh, when Prof had Stephanie on an, um, an Afrikaans, I remember those big words. It was just a bit tough to now try and translate it. Um, there was a certain period of time on the protocol where Stephanie was uh, getting lumbar punches, LPs, uh, four weeks in a row every second day. And I managed to go, come in on a Monday morning, seven o'clock, we'll, four o'clock I'll leave Harry Smith, seven o'clock I'll check in. When we get to Villiers, I'll give her the, uh, um, the medication, the Dormicum. And by the time we reached Unitas Hospital, she was nice and far down in Dreamland. But not for too long. Then Stephanie started saying, Mommy, please don't give this to me again. I'd rather take things live and the bone marrow aspirations than what I don't know what they're busy doing with me while I'm asleep. And it went well. Only thing I had to promise my daughter is I tell her exactly what step they're busy with next. When it's a scalpel, I, don't, I can't play games. I need to say this is a scalpel. Then I need to say, okay, Dr. Vessels is bringing the, uh, the little pipe closer. Now he's, he made the small in incision, putting it in. Now he's battling a bit. And then I will stay a little bit hovering over this. And they say, okay, right, <laughs> we're through now. The only thing was I had to hold my daughter's hand throughout the whole procedure. And keep my happy face on while she was having a strong face on. So my daughter Yolanda had to go back every time. So same with us. Prof Kruger always made time for us to, to as a family um, when Stephanie's father was coming to visit. And with Yolanda from Harry Smith, we saw we used to put the two beds together and we had a nice Christmas bed 
for the four of us for the whole weekend. Monday, Alonza and, and uh, I had to go back and I had to answer the questions of all the concerned people in Arismith. So please, uh, you are seeing what you're seeing. This is a, a, a packed, packed red cells, Prof. Greer, there, hanging against the, on your right hand side. I, uh, this was, I just reached, I just reached Harry Smith back and I got a call from Prof. Kruger. Stella, the, the full blood count is not what we want it to be. And I said, four hours back again to Pretoria, maybe not today. So we made a plan. We got packed cells from, for, for Stephanie from Ladysmith. And I was that night, as a mother, I was writing over a, um, I just copied literally by hand writing a recipe book over into another A4 to stay awake and take the observations of my daughter throughout the time to check the breathing, the pulse, everything Prof. Kruger taught me to do. And we got through it. And the HP the next day, I know, I do remember Harry Smith had five doctors, doctors, GPs, and I think four of the five was on standby through the night, wondering if Stella's going to do it right. But through the grace of God, we managed to, to do that. Second time around, we spent 12 days in ICU with something that where we struck a hiccup. <clears throat> Stephanie had a, 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 um, a pseudomona with a, a, a count, infection count of 552. I do remember Prof. Kruger, I think the norm the normal values is zero, between zero and five, or between five and whatever, but it was not close to what, what her actual count was at the time. So Prof. Kruger decided four different antibiotics during the course of the day because this terrible thing was changing its, its sensitivity every 48 hours, so whenever they take blood and uh, uh, use the growing medium, by the time we get the results for what this is sensitive for, it has already changed its sensitivity. So we didn't have a, another option. We had to stop the, the chemo. And within three days, we started with the um, uh, uh, radiation it, in, in town. I think it was Dr. de Mielenaar and them. So now, because it was the cerebrospinal uh, 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 fluids, we had to do the, to get the radiation done, cranial, and Prof. Kruger told us, remember, we're going to get this done, but please bear in mind that um, 30 years of research did show that your daughter might, st might learn way slower in future. Well, Stephanie proven 30 years of research wrong, with the grace of God. And she still continued doing her mathematics. She doesn't, didn't love it a lot, but neither did I. And I didn't have radiation. Um, so it was just a family thing, I suppose. So 12 days in Pete's ICU with a porticath. You'll see on the right-hand side picture, Stephanie still smiling. At this point of time, the hair was already coming off in bundles and bundles and bundles. Later on, she just said, Mommy, can't we just get rid of this because I find it in my tea, I find it in the porridge, I find it in the yogurt, everywhere. Can we just please get rid of it and get a cloth, a face cloth to, to brush my hair with? And I was okay with it. So I stayed with my daughter in, in ICU. As a mother, it is, again, Stephanie will only fall asleep when she feels either my hand or my arm, or she puts her leg over my leg. So um, I had to lose a lot of weight because those beds are not very wide. At least they had a, a, a pull-up on the side, so I was just doing my level best to stay between those. Stephanie, at that point of time, because the, the pseudomona is spread from the back of the buttocks, um, between the legs through the labia, and it was heading towards the, the, the navel. Uh, previously, pro, uh, Prof told us in history it was 100% mortality rate when something like this goes into the intestine. Please forgive me if I don't use the big, big words, but I can't remember them. I did know it at that time. I just don't remember it anymore. I lie. Right, so at that point of time, we had to make a decision. Um, we had to 
uh, Stephanie had to get a colostomy um, because now the wound was, the open wound at that point of time was almost as big as a tennis ball and she was like five years old so there wasn't really much more butt to, to remove. We had to remove the, the, the um, tissue. I do remember Dr. Martin van Kerk telling me that as far as he cut, it is like water, water tissue, and he have to cut until he get blood. And later on, we, we could literally fit in a tennis ball in, the, in that gap that was created. I also do remember having a, a, a very special, uh, I studied medical assistance, it's not a 16th of what, what you guys have studied, but uh, at that point of time, I could maintain myself next to Stephanie's bed. I used to scrub up with the doctors. Um, I was allowed into theatre. I would put the strawberry mask on my daughter's face so she could fall asleep. And then I would stand and watch. I fainted only the first time. After that, I was upright and I had to put on my... Um, I had to, uh, to do women up and then take whatever's coming my, my way. What was very therapeutic to me was the fact that I could do my daughter's dressings inside theater before she came out because now I understood what was happening underneath those dressings. We would plug the wound with um, uh, apple cider vinegar because that terrible germ my daughter had was, uh, didn't like the, the, uh, uh, the acidity. And that was basically, by then we used all the antibiotics we could. Stephanie was on 24 hours of um, morphine. I can't remember the levels, but it was a big injection like this above her head, and it was just running, running, running every day. And Prof tried to explain to me how it used once you stopped, when it, when, how you're going to wean, have to wean the child. And I was just praying we get to the point where we can start weaning. But until then, I had to pray and kept on praying that uh, my daughter was going to get to that point and that she was pain-free. So the picture on the right-hand side shows the saturation, the ECG machine, the um, um, porticath, broviac, suprapubical uh, supra catheter. Um, and then one thing I think nobody will forget, not the sisters in ICU or the patients that could hear anything. There was a, a cassette that was playing in that radio above Stephanie's head. And it was just driving everybody crazy, but my daughter wanted to hear that. So I would have played backwards as well if I had to. It was good for her at the time. So Stephanie weighed 11 kilos for very, very, very long um, until she almost reached the age of six. And Prof Kruger once again had to make a plan with the, um, uh, with the, the, the fiber. Prof Kruger, it was the fiber that it looked like in a sock that we had to put in just to get something into Stephanie's stomach. And yeah, so my little girl pulled, pulled through that again. This was Stephanie. A very difficult young lady, because now we were on um, cortisone and steroids. So when, when Prof said, when your daughter wants to eat, you get her what she wants so she can eat, because they, when they're not on that, that protocol, she's not going to want to eat. I remember one night I walked from, uh, from Unitas Hospital to somewhere, I don't know, uh, few blocks, but it, I had to wait till she slept because now she was feeling like having English cucumbers. Nothing in the hospital she wanted, but she wanted English cucumbers. I asked the nurses and the sisters, Sister Donna, please let me know. Please have, keep an eye on her because if, if my daughter wakes up and I'm not there, she would shout that that unitas roof would lift. So I was taking the big hike, the long walk to Freedom down to, to the checkers or the Oh, no, it was actually a, a, a garage even, and I, with that quick shops. I bought four cucumbers, and I thought, right, we sorted for the week. I got back, Stephanie opened her eyes as I walked in, and half an hour later, all four cucumbers was polished. So next day, 
she was feeling like having putu pop. Putu pop wasn't at that point of time on the menu for, for UNITAS. So one of the sisters, Sister Rani Boysen, had to improvise and bring me putu pop. And she couldn't wait to come back at night shift again. She had to make it and come back while the others were working day shift. So my challenge at this point of time, if you're looking at Stephanie's bolt, obviously a little, only little hair, big frown. Under that little jacket was a big tummy, very uncomfortable, uh, shallow breathing, but the legs were like two matches, matchsticks. The only thing my daughter asked me was, Mommy, please make my ski pants sit tight around my legs. Needless to say, it was supposed to be relaxed around the belly. So my challenge there was then my hand sewing skills in hospital got to extremely close to perfection because I had to even uh, um, a Barbie ski pants head, I had to sew with a hand tight around the legs, leave it loose around the, the middle. Anybody that knows how ski pant work, you'll know it's, it doesn't usually sit loose around the, the, either of the two places. So Stephanie had a, a special, very special um, cousin, and he wrote at the age of 11, he was Pita. He was uh, staying in uh, Botswana. He couldn't visit Stephanie. And um, Stephanie, he wrote a, a poem for Stephanie. So I've, I've tried my level best to um, translate it into English for whoever is not understanding the, the Afrikaans. But Kriki, don't you please just want to come and read the Afrikaans version quickly for us? Kriki is Stephanie. So he wrote it at the age of 11. <clears throat> and... Please forgive me for the picture with a little bit of uh, marks here and there, but as Stephanie is turning 30 this year, she is, uh, she's already keeping, she's still keeping this against the wall in her room. God het ons gesien met so a kind. Belangrijker als die sterre praag op een wind, op, as kies toch op wind. Op drie kruis sy toe kanker, dit bly vast in ons hartige anker. Ons begin treer en trane stoort, maar ons glo dat sy gezond sal word. Haar sissie, ma en pa, het toe begin genade vra. Familie het begin bid dat sy gezond sal word, en die Heere het genade oor ons uitgestoord. Sy is te genees, Sonder angst of vrees. In 98 is sy weer terug. En in ons begin die gees weer vrug. Die dokters kom allemaal te saam en probeer een plan beraam. Die dokters het die kwaad gevind van ons lieve kankerkind. Hy sal haar, ons, sy, toch, hy sal haar op sy hande dra, terwijl ons steeds genade vra. Sy probeer dit steeds beveg. Hij bly steeds aan God geheg. Ons was allemaal erg bevrees, maar die kracht van boe sal die kind genees. Pieter Sertoon. And this is living proof that the Lord once again, we declare him as the one and only Jesus Christ, and that he was the one that stepped in and healed Stephanie. Today where she's turning 13 uh, on the 20s, 1st of December. I am almost done. Thank you, Kriki. My uh, something else that I that I that I realised as a parent, what was very important, is to give your child something to cling on to while they while they hanging, trying trying to make out of what's happening to their own lives with their own bodies why people are, are, are there every now and then and, and, and again. Um, you know, visitors come in and say, uh, ma'am, what's wrong? And that, and you just like, seriously, my daughter don't have a hair on her, on her head and you're asking me what's wrong. My own, my own parents were farmers and my most useful tip from them at that time was um, 
continuous pray, praying, support and uh, the support, and planting some seeds that grows fast. By doing this, Stephanie had to water them daily. We decided to plant radish um, seeds um, because they grow fast. It comes up within two to three days, and so. So Stephanie had to water them daily and keep them to keep her mind going, looking forward to tomorrow as uh, it's a fast grower. And then she was living for each next day, um, in which the little seed showed itself, and then watch she could watch them getting bigger every day. And as a mother, it kept me going to see my daughter. She's ke she keeps going. There was a lot of. Um, Areas, you know, people invite you and say, okay, there's granite, um, but bring the, the sibling with. This also kept us going. We, we did walk a lot of miles in Unitas Hospital, miles and miles in the passage of Unitas. And our kids who was on scooties because it was one of the survival guides Prof Kruger gave us, saying you need to bring, your child need to bring these kopfitsis, these scooties. It helps with the... With the uh, um, muscles and the nerves and I, I was just happy to see that my daughter could still do that. The art year was for the parents to keep up with the IVAX because there was a certain area at the hospital that had a long decline and you as a mother had to just simply keep up because remember that that IVAC is going somewhere with it with the IV. What we did manage to, what we did manage, what was difficult was once the child get into the into the um, lift before you, and the door the door started closing. Then you have seen Johnty Rhodes. He will he will he will be proud of. He would have been proud of me, because I could dive inside a, a door like there's no tomorrow, if my daughter's on the inside. Then your daughter also, my daughter also got confronted with a lot of comments of the people. You know when you walk in the passages, um, your child just needs to get out of the ward a little bit. You get these people, I mean, we even put cutics on the fingernails, earrings in the ears, everything. And then they'll still come to you and say, oh, I'm sorry, is, is your boy ill? And I remember uh, myself and Vera was, uh, was in the, uh, going towards the, the lift and the one person saying, oh, what's, what's wrong with your children? Are they ill? And Vera with a dry humor, again, she said, ach, sommere lichte verkouwe. <laughs> so needless to say, those people's eyes were this big. Because, you know, lichte verkouwe doesn't just look like this. There was also once when my daughter was sitting, we were sitting in the reception, and there was a little girl Walking around, walking around, going towards the mom, come back, chattering in the mom's ear, come back. She came to stand in front of my daughter like this. She said to her, I know what's wrong with you. You've got cancer, you're only going to live another few more days and then you're going to die. I know people will understand when I say, Jy ken my nie. Because I had to take three deep breaths. Number one is Stephanie, by the grace of God, decided to look away and act as if she hasn't heard anything. But I couldn't get it right. So I would take that little girl at the shoulders and say to her, you know what? It's true. Everybody's going to die. But so are you. So is your mummy. So is your daddy. So am I. But I can tell you one thing now. My daughter's not going to die in three days. I had to woman up and stand my ground, supporting my daughter to believe she will heal. Even if I had to use brainwashing tactics. I would set a clock, alarm clock, every 30 minutes through the day and night. Obviously, she didn't get all the rest Prof Kruger wanted her to get. But I would wake up my daughter, and while she was small, I would say, Stephanie, Jesus is going to heal you. 
Every half an hour, I would do that. Later, and I would, when I just do this, she's like, yeah, mommy, I know Jesus is going to heal me. And she'd turn around and sleep. So that's where the brainwashing tactics came from. On the... <clears throat> we took a lot of pictures, took a lot of... had a lot of memories. It was good. We were in a fortunate position where the two girls could could be together at times when, when we could make it possible. Every time I see my two girls, I hope and pray that they would be together forever and smiling their way into adulthood. And they still do because there's the living proof of this. Even though Stephanie's older sister, Ilanza, is living in Germany, um, they, they're still so, so, so close. They're still extremely close. And I'm so thankful for it because it could easily go the other way around. Our children are being, fa they face um, different types of objection in the world out there. Stephanie wanted to go, um, wanted to, she's an au pair. She wanted to, uh, she applied for America. And when they heard about her health um, issues, they said, no, they, she's not allowed to come to America. It's not my daughter's fault that she got it that she was diagnosed. In, some, in the, the USA at that point of time felt that if something happens to her health-wise, they won't be able to look after her. But she did manage to go to the Netherlands for a year, and she finished her, her one year there at the Netherlands as an au pair, and she's doing a sterling job. Then, Prof Kruger, we met in Amsterdam streets for a beer. This was at, I think, 10.30 at night with the blue skies at the back. And it was, it was honestly a time that we could celebrate with Professor Kruger with regarding to where a, a, a prof, a, a doctor that, would, that was walking the walk with us as a family twice. And everything, believe you me, everything that could go wrong, did go wrong with Stephanie. She got shingles while she was immune suppressed. We had two TB scares while she had chemotherapy. She got chicken pox. When she got the chicken pox, I had to rush her out of hospital and not to hospital because of the other kids that were all immune suppressed. And at that point of time, I don't think um, the, the, well, I was able to look at her, to look after her at, her at home. Uh, she had encephalitis once. That time she chose to get encephalitis while Prof was in Belgium busy with the thesis. I'll not forget that Prof later on said, I'm not going to tell you I'm leaving the country because then your child pool stunts. And it felt like it, I promise you. She got... Um, uh, polio drops, they, they administered polio drops to my daughter at the creche that she attended at the time. And I do remember getting a call from Professor Kruger and threatening the health authorities because they clearly didn't understand what they were doing at the time with an immune suppressed child. What my daughter kept behind is during the ceremony, she, she had to go into theater 14 times in three weeks' time. My daughter started waking up under anesthetics while we were busy working on her. She uh, had, obviously, problems with the teeth, even now. And um, one, of, one of the legs is slightly shorter than the others because of over... Um, stimulation after the, the ceremony. But I can, with all due respect, say if there's one thing I've learned from this whole experience was that you can never plan two minutes ahead. And Prof. Kruger gave me four pointers that I will never forget. The one thing is teach your child to drink tablets by swallowing Smarties when she's not three years as yet and she need to drink 
um, 14 tablets every four hours. The children had to wear day clothes during the day so that they don't have the hospital feeling all, all around. The scooters are already mentioned. They had to sleep from 12 to 3, and I also, Stephanie, that Stephanie started sleeping for the first team. And um, to keep a diary every day of everything that your child has gone through, what the full blood count was like when it came out, what she drank, what she ate, and uh, what the reactions was. And the full meaning of that was actually four or five days down the line, you look at the diary and you say, it's not that bad today because about five days ago, ago it was very, very, very bad if I look at the diary. And that became my survival kit. Prof Kruger, thank you so much from me and my big family. <laughs> all the cousins, all the nieces, everybody. Thank you so much for, for, from, from Stephanie from, and from myself and for everybody that loves Stephanie. Peter said I must please thank you specifically for allowing him to come and visit her from, from Botswana. We really appreciate your 26 hours a day availability, not only 24. And we thank the Lord that, that he took us on this road with you. I wouldn't have chosen any other prof to work with or to go on this road with me and my child. Really thank you for that and thank you for always having that professional way whenever you had to tell me there's nothing we can do now, now we can only pray. I'll never forget that day. And we did. And I'm thankful once again that, that you took us on that professional road. And once again I just need to declare and we know that the, it was definitely the Lord's way and it was the Lord that stepped in, in healing my child. One last thing Prof said to me always, keep in mind you talk about sick free or ill free years. But I, I again, now it was my turn to be deaf. I'm talking about healing with my daughter. Thank you for making the time to listen. Stella for that very powerful and personal message and uh, I think we all know Prof Kruger but I mean we also realize her influence is much wider than we were exposed to during our last 15 years and all the good work she's done at, at different places. Okay so next speaker is Prof Kruger. Um, I'm not going to give a rundown of all her achievements because uh, we don't have time for that. Uh, <laughs> So I'm just going to say, I mean, obviously we are we're privileged to have Prof as of the department. I forget how many years, 13, 14 years, but just in two sentences. So 14, 13 years ago, myself, Rob, Sharon, um, and Louis, Johan, and Gert worked in A9, and that's where we worked. Uh, and we thought we were in control. Uh, so we worked, we watched a bit of TV and watched some cricket in a gas room. Nowadays we can't even watch cricket anymore, so we were very happy in what we did. So I don't know if you follow the news, but recently the Americans sent a rocket and it hit an astronaut. So that's the first time ever a rocket was sent up to hit an astronaut out of his where he was rotating. Uh, so to take it back simplistically, Prof. Kruger was the rocket and we were the astronaut that got it. <laughs> so she put us on a different track and worse of that, she was from Pretoria, so most of us are not Blue Bull supporters. So things couldn't start off on the worst note possible. Uh, and, and, but I mean, uh, she hit us hard. <laughs> Took a long time to recover. Uh, but. <laughs> She put us in a different track, and I mean, that's very good. So we started on a new journey uh, with, like, we were reborn, and we started on a course <laughs> that uh, 
None of all of us were very convinced in the beginning this is the right one. <laughs> But she developed us, and I mean, she, she, we, we, she mentored us, and we achieved a lot during a time period. And I mean, you can just look at a number of, of PhDs that have been achieved. We were all doing PhDs those years, but it just took us a bit longer because there was no urgency to get this thing done. So <laughs> we were happy what we were doing. But then she came along uh, and um, hurried us along. But I think, I mean, I, I was, when I walk out of my office, I see the picture. Of, of the four previous heads of departments. And one does realize we only had four heads of departments in our whole lifetime that this department was. So for me, it has been always been a privilege of having as you as your boss. I told her the other day, each of us needs a leader. What doesn't matter where you are in your life or what you do. Sometimes you need someone to actually help you and guide you. And, and in what the circumstances ever may be. So for me, she was that person that always led us. This is the person we looked up. And looking at today, you can see her, her influence in so many different areas. It's not just one. We might love us just one thing, simple thing, work with the lung. Uh, but she has a lot of other stuff going around and did a lot of other stuff in her career and still doing it. And then to, I think the nicest thing of a clinician is to have to have parents come back and tell these stories. And I think that's the beauty of it. We get so used to what we do, but that we actually don't always remember that they actually work with patients. And, and, and people do leave a lasting impression with patients. And it's always one of the nicest. It's not your 50, 100 articles you publish, but it's the dust stuff you did on a human level. And I think that's what Prof does. She, did. she left the mark in many, many different places. So Prof, welcome. Okay, so Prof is going to talk a career combining basic science, pediatrics, and ethics. Yeah, I wasn't quite sure what to do today um, because I recently did give a professionalism talk, and so I thought perhaps I'll just share a little bit of how it came about and where, how I have all these interests. Um, and I think I'm going to start off with my biggest role model. Uh, Prof Dani has spoken about role models, and that was throughout my career, well, as a youngster, uh, Margot Fontaine, and who, when she heard she became the prima ballerina of the company, said, looking at the other ballerina, what a beautiful step, I shall never be able to dance it. And I still feel, uh, if I look at all my mentors that went before me, that I shall not be able to follow their steps. But I've had many, and I've been very fortunate, and they were from uh, pediatric oncologists, hematologists, to philosophers, and so on. And, and it really, every mentor has meant something to me and has taught me quite a lot along this journey of my 40 years of career, which is ending this year. <clears throat> so I'm going to sort of share how I came to pediatric oncology, uh, how I ended up in basic sciences, and how ethics became part of uh, my career. So when I was a registrar in, in 1985, I was doing a whole round with Prof. Prinsloo, who was our head of department at California Hospital. And he was very excited when we got an acute mild leukemia patient showing us all the gum hypertrophy and all the signs, and thereafter never wanted to see the child, because he said, no, that's cancer, the child's going to die anyway. So I unofficially started the first pediatric oncology as a registrar, and I would go after hours and go and treat these children, went to the department at HFV to learn and then go back and apply it in, in, in my free time there. And then when I qualified as a registrar, I was now assuming I'm going to be the person looking after them. And then the head of the department decided to appoint another pediatric oncologist. So I ended up going to Prof. Foxen at HFVUT, where I trained uh, as a, uh, in oncology. He was, it was a uh, combined medical oncology department. Uh, of course, it was a bad years of apartheid. I had, to, uh, I had colored patients and Indian kids, and I got uh, quite a lot of aggression from everybody because I refused to treat them outside uh, where we treated the white patients. So I brought all these kids in as well. And of course, it was a combined adult and uh, un child unit, so it was quite uh, tough at the time. So I therefore left. I couldn't stand uh, the system, and I went back to Kalafong, 
and then ended up being invited to do a locum in Leuven, in Gasteisberg, in 1890, and which really changed my life, because Professor Castiels van Dahle, whom you see down here at the bottom, she was a 2IC in the department, she was a pediatric oncologist, her husband was a dean, they were the local mafia of uh, Leuven, and she came up when the end of my locum to say, don't I want to come and do research towards a PhD with a fund that she got from Como 